I'm going to read some verses from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6. This evening, Matthew 6, this comes as part of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is addressing primarily his disciples. There's a crowd there who are listening, though actually the Sermon on the Mount was addressed to the disciples of Jesus. It's the most concentrated record we have of his teaching. Occupies chapter 5, 6, and 7. And in chapter 6, he talks about prayer in verses 5 to verse 15. And we're going to be talking about prayer for the next several Sundays. And I want to open up this subject tonight because it's such an important issue. Matthew 6 and verse 5, Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And I'm going to talk tonight and uh, for several Sundays, Sunday evenings, about this most important dimension of Christian living, prayer. Now, I know it would be very easy to heap a sense of guilt on most of us about this, because if I were to ask around tonight, how many of you believe in the importance of prayer, I imagine most hands would go up, that's why you're here. If I said to you, how many of you are satisfied with your prayer life, I think there would be very few hands that would go up, and out of humility, even those wouldn't put their hands up. <laughs> but most of us, being strictly honest would say, I am thoroughly dissatisfied with my prayer life. And if there's a big discrepancy in many Christian lives, my own included, I come to you as a learner tonight, it's between what we believe about prayer and what we do about prayer. One of the evidences of that is in most churches, wherever you go across the world, the least attended meeting of the church calendar is the prayer meeting. And we'll talk about some of those things in the course of our time. I know we all have busy lives, but we find time for the important things. In fact, what we do with that time tells what is important to us. But I want to suggest to you that this area is where we may find the deepest joy in our Christian walk and it's also the area where many of us find our biggest struggle. Now I want to just quote you two verses which I want to lie, lay at the foundation of what we'll talk about over these several weeks. First of all, you needn't turn to it, I'll just read you. In Luke chapter 11, it says, verse 1, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when it finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And whoever that disciple was, it doesn't say, one of those disciples made that request. Whoever it was, it must have been because he saw in Jesus there was something about his communion with his Father and his intimacy with his Father that he longed for. Lord, teach me to experience this. And on the basis of these studies I want to do together with you is this prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. Not how to pray. There are all kinds of methods. And we may talk about those. 
but teach us to pray. Teach us to connect with God. And the other verse, the foundation of all of this is that verse in Romans 8, 26. In the same way, says Paul, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans the words cannot express. On the one hand, teach us to pray. On the other hand, we don't know what to pray for. And so we ask the Holy Spirit, as that verse says, the Spirit himself intercedes for us to help us in our praying. Because most of us here tonight need help in our prayer life. No matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how well developed your prayer life may be, we need help. And I'm calling this series A Journey into the Heart of God. Because that's where the focus of praying needs to be. It's a journey into the heart of God. In a real sense, that's what prayer is. It is a means of intimacy with God. Not just through the times we spend on our knees in prayer, important as that is, but in the constant sense of communion with God that we're to enjoy throughout the day. That's what Paul had in mind when he wrote in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean keep your hands together and your eyes closed without ceasing. Of course it doesn't. But in the whole of your life, no matter what you're doing or who you're with, you're in constant touch with God and it becomes second nature. Brother Andrew, not Brother Andrew, Brother Lawrence wrote a famous book. Brother Andrew is somebody else. Brother Lawrence is long deceased. Brother Andrew is going to be here in about three weeks' time to speak. I hope you'll be here that Sunday. But uh, Brother Lawrence wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. Very helpful book to many people, and he describes there his prayer life as simply practicing the presence of God. You bring God in to everything in your daily life. E.M. Bounds is a man who's written several books on prayer. One of his books is called Power Through Prayer. And there's a line in the first page of that book, which when I first read it several years ago really hit me. What he says is this, the church is looking for better methods, God is looking for better men. He meant people. But this was written many years ago. The church is looking for better methods, God is looking for better people. You see, the Holy Spirit does not throw through, flow through methods. The Holy Spirit does not anoint machinery. The Holy Spirit does not empower plans. He flows through people. He anoints people. He empowers people. The raw material for accomplishing God's work in the world is right here tonight in this building. It's you. It's me. But what kind of people? You see, prayer and the Spirit-filled life are very closely connected. Graham Scroggy, who was a well-known preacher in the first part of last century, the 20th century, wrote in his book called Method in Prayer, he wrote, one of the biggest mistakes that a Christian can ever make is to imagine that increased social or spiritual activity can be any compensation for the lack of of secret communion with God. No spiritual activity, he's saying there, can be a substitute for a lack of spiritual communion with God. And he goes on to say, a prayerful life is always a powerful life, and a prayerless life is always a powerless life. Not as we'll see, because prayer is powerful. But prayer is the means whereby God, who alone is powerful, can engage with us and work in us and work through us. Now in these verses we read together in Matthew 6, which I'm going to speak from over these several occasions, there are a number of things that Jesus talks about here. He talks about how to pray in verses 5, 6, and 7. And he gives some very practical instructions there about closing the door and being on your own and so on. That's one aspect of prayer, but we'll look at that on some occasion, not tonight. 
He talks not only about how we should pray, but why we should pray, or he implies why we should pray, because in verse 8, very tantalizingly, he says, don't be like them, that's the pagans who just babble empty words, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now why I say that's tantalizing is he doesn't say your Father knows what you need, so you don't need to ask him. All you need to say is your will be done, amen, and you've done your praying. He says you need to ask Him. Your Father knows what you need. So that raises the question, why in the world do we need to ask God for things when He already knows that we need them? This was a big stumbling block to me in prayer for quite a while. Because I reasoned this way. If God is sovereign as He is, if God's plans are good as they are, why should I spend time telling God things that he already knows? And he's already got plans about. That he's already decided. Because I knew I'd never pray to God and say, God, would you please do this, 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 and this? And God would listen to my prayer and say to a few angels, did you hear what that man just said? Isn't that a fantastic idea? I'd never thought of that before. I think that's fantastic. Let's do that. I knew that would never happen. So a reason why spend time making suggestions to God about what I think He should do. Why not just say, Lord, you know everything, your will be done, amen. Wouldn't that be satisfactory? But evidently not. And then I reasoned this. If God knows everything there is to know, what is the point of me spending time telling God things or telling God about people that He already knows? I knew I'd never pray and say, Lord, I want to pray for Mrs. Smith who's in hospital having her, her appendix out and God will listen to my prayer and say, Mrs. Smith, I wonder where in the world she was. Oh, so she is. She's in hospital having her appendix out. I'm glad you told me. <laughs> I'd never suggest to God anything He didn't already know and I'd never tell God anything He didn't already know. I wouldn't suggest to God anything he didn't, hadn't already thought of, is what I meant, and I wouldn't tell him something he hasn't already known. So why spend time praying? It's a very important question. It was about nine or ten years of asking that question before I ever discovered the answer. I'm going to share the answer with you on another week. <laughs> because it transformed my prayer life. But it comes up here, that's why, why we should pray. And then the third thing that comes up in these verses is what we should pray. Pray like this. And he quotes the Lord's Prayer. And unfortunately, many people just babble it the way Jesus said, don't babble like pagans, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, and we just babble it. <laughs> Without any real understanding, it's a real pattern for how we should pray. So we look at that as well. But I want tonight to talk about one aspect that comes up in these early verses in Matthew 6 about how we should pray because there's a recurring idea that comes through several times. Here it is, verse 5, and when you pray. That's all, verse 6, and when you pray. Sorry, that was in verse 5, then in verse 6, when you pray. Then in verse 7, he says, and when you pray. Now notice, he doesn't say now if you pray. He says when you pray. The assumption of that made by Jesus is that prayer is going to be a regular, normal part of our Christian life. When you pray. Now, Prayer has both an objective value and a subjective value. Let me explain what I mean by that. By objective value, what I mean is that other people are affected by our praying. Your praying can actually make a difference. When I was in my late teens, I did an experiment. I began to pray for a situation that I knew where I could have absolutely no influence. And I began to pray certain specific things. And in six months, those things that I was praying for began to happen. And I was over the moon with excitement. Prayer actually can influence people on the other side of the world. That's why the book of James says in James 4 and verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask God. 
We'll talk about that on another evening. But there is a subjective value to praying, which is what we talk about tonight. That is, we ourselves are affected by our praying. And I want to talk tonight about the benefit of praying to the person who does the praying. In other words, if God never answered your prayers, and we're talking about answered prayer, we normally define answered prayer as when God does what we suggest that he should do. That's what we call answered prayer. God answers prayer, of course, much more broadly than that. But just supposing God never answered your praying, just supposing that the sovereignty of God is such that there is absolutely no room for any maneuver, and that may be a debatable point, but if you have not because you ask not, your praying certainly makes a difference, but if that was the case, there is still enormous benefit in praying. Because one of the first things that changes when you and I pray is you and me. Now let me ask a fundamental question. What exactly is the Christian life? I mean, how do we define it? Well, there are various ways we might try to define it. We might define it, for instance, as a belief system. In fact, I talked to somebody last Sunday morning at the end of the service about Christianity as a belief system. That was his very term. He asked me about our belief system. Well, if it's just a belief system, it's a way of looking at the world. And if it's a belief system, the most important thing to do is probably to dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure we get it right. And in that case, the primary issue in Christianity is getting a good grasp of systematic theology because it's primarily a belief system. Well, that may be one view. Another view is that Christianity is primarily an experience. Well, certainly, of course, experience is involved. But if that is what Christianity primarily is, then when we get together like this, our primary objective ought to be to try and create experiences, or recreate experiences, or enhance our experiences. But the problem with experiences is they become history very quickly and we begin to look back on them in nostalgia and they become stale. You might look, book, might look back on your wedding day, for instance. You can't recreate it, but it's a nice memory for some of you. <laughs> or you look back on some great vacation. Or you look back on the time you did the bungee jump or whatever, you know, gives you a kick. <laughs> and Christianity sometimes is regarded as an experience and you talk about those experiences and you look back on them, you try to recreate them. Is Christianity the third option? Is it, is it, is it feelings? Is it a, a good feeling? That is, we emotionally connect with God and that is primarily what it's about. If that was so, we meet together, our primary objective would be to create an emotional high for us, if that was primarily what it was. And if we start to do that, then the danger is that our worship becomes not about the object of our worship, which is God, but about the subject of our worship, which is us. And if we felt good, then we've worshipped. Now, all these things, of course, have their valid place. There is plenty to believe, and we need to believe the truth. There is lots to experience. There are wonderful things to feel in our connection with God. But if we were to say, how do we define the Christian life? It is defined primarily in Scripture as a relationship. It's a relationship. Let me quote you from John 17 and verse 3. Jesus is speaking there. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now said Jesus, this is eternal life. It is knowing God and it is knowing Christ. In other words, it's a relationship. Now if the Christian life is a relationship, on its simplest level, this is what prayer is. Prayer is the talking part of the relationship. 
Because relationships thrive on communication. And I want to give you three points tonight. They're very simple points. I'm almost apologetic, but I won't be apologetic for the simplicity of these things I'm going to share with you tonight. Usually the simpler we make it, the more true it is, actually. Here's my first point. Prayer brings us into relationship. That is, it brings us into communication. It brings us into contact with God. You see, talking is a key ingredient in any relationship. And every time human relationships fall apart, it is almost always because of a breakdown in communication. Almost always. When governments lose touch with the people, the cry is they've stopped listening to the needs of the people. When industry runs into conflict management with the unions, the cry is let's negotiate, let's get around the table, let's talk, let's communicate, let's understand each other. When marriages run into trouble, the number one reason I'm told for marriage breakdown is poor communication. We stop talking and we stop listening. We stop listening is probably more crucial than stopping talking, actually. When friendships dry up, it's because we stop spending time together. And let me tell you this, when the Christian life becomes dull, when God becomes distant, when our Christian experience becomes dry, you can be pretty sure there's very little praying going on. I've asked the question many times and I've sat with people who say, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe in God, I love Jesus Christ, but my Christian life is dry. God seems distant to me. One of the questions I ask is this, how much time do you spend alone with God? And although that's not the only reason, almost always, almost universally, they'll say, that's my weak spot. And of course the Christian life is dry. What do you expect if the Christian life is a relationship and we don't spend time talking and listening? Let me illustrate this. Can you imagine a couple getting married? You need a good imagination for this. After the wedding meal, the husband turns to his bride and says to her, I really enjoyed that meal. Would you thank your parents for putting it on for us? I'm not sure how it is here in Canada, but in England, uh, the wife's family pay for the meal. Is that right here? Okay. That's a shame. I was hoping to be getting away from that because I've got more daughters and sons. <laughs> But he says, would you, would you please thank your parents for putting this meal on for us? I think it was great. I would have th thanked them myself, but actually I'm not going to have time because I've arranged to play golf with a friend of mine later this afternoon, and I, I didn't think the, wedding, the pictures would take so long, so we're a bit late, and, and I have to go quickly to meet him. And after we've played our game of golf, I'm probably going for a meal with him, but I'll be back tonight, so I'll see you then. Is that okay? Bye. You need a good imagination. He takes off, comes home late that night, makes himself a cup of coffee, halfway through his cup of coffee. He says, oh, I just remembered I got married today. I forgot about that. Where, where, where's, where's my wife? I forgot. I'm not used to having you here. Oh, there she is. I'm sorry about that. I'm not used to having you here. Look, I, I'm dead beat now. I'll see you in the morning. And he gets up early in the morning, makes himself another cup of coffee. He says, oh, I just remembered I got a wife. He goes, Look, I'm sorry. I'm not used to having you there. I didn't notice you this morning. Listen, I'm going to be out um, all day today. Um, I'll probably be back sometime tonight. I may not be back till tomorrow because I've got some business that may take me away overnight. But I'll see you when I get back. Bye-bye. And off he goes. Comes back late that night, makes a cup of coffee. Oh, where's my wife? I just remember that. It's just supposing that happened and you met that man or his wife about three months later and you said, how are you enjoying marriage? Would it surprise you if they said, actually, it's very dull. <laughs> it's not really working. Of course it wouldn't surprise you. But you know, that's exactly how many of us treat God. We get up in the morning, have a quick good morning. God, thank you for looking after me last night. Please look after me today. Answer all my prayers and bless me. Amen. And then before we go to bed at night, we have a quick, thank you for looking after me today. Please give me a good night's sleep tonight. Take away all my nightmares. Bless all the missionaries. Uh, save everybody else and look after Granny. Amen. <laughs> 
It takes about 30 seconds a day. And then we say, why does God seem so distant from me? Of course he's distant if we don't communicate with him and talk with him. And that's why I'm calling this series a journey into the heart of God. In a real sense, that's what prayer is. That's the most important dimension of prayer. It's not that God is waiting for our shopping lists, though we have that wonderful privilege of interceding. But he's inviting us into his heart. My wife sometimes says to me, let me into your heart. When I'm, you know, a bit distant, or I'm hiding in my cave, whatever I'm doing, because that's what men do. <laughs> let me into your heart. Well, this is getting into the heart of God. Bill Hybels has written a book called Too Busy Not to Pray. And he explains in that book how that for 20 years he had not taken time to pray with any discipline or any regularity. He was praying on the hoof, so to speak. He had not taken time to pray. And then he began to structure his life so there was time to pray. And he says this, I come in the middle of a sentence, when he did this, my life has been transformed. The greatest fulfillment has not been the list of miracle, miraculous answers to prayer I've received, although that has been wonderful. The greatest thrill has been the qualitative difference in my relationship with God. And when I started to pray, I didn't know that was going to happen. The greatest change in my life from praying is the quality in my relation with God. And he says, I didn't know that was going to happen. Because his motive to pray was, there are lots of things I need to bring God into that God will do in my life, and God will do in our church, and God will do in our nation. And that's what I'm praying about. But I discovered... The greatest thing was I suddenly began to love God in a new way and enjoy Him in a new way. You see, prayer is the oxygen of the soul. And deny yourself the oxygen and you begin to starve. When Jesus called His 12 disciples, 12 apostles, in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 3, it tells us what the purpose of calling his disciples was. In Mark chapter 3, and let me read it to you. In verse 14, it says, He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, listen to this, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. Now there are two dimensions to their calling there. He called them, number one, that they might be with him. Number two, that they might be sent out and preach and serve him. And I want to suggest to you that those two aspects must never be separated there is an in aspect, he called them into himself, and an out aspect, he sent them out to serve, but going out to serve will be barren and powerless unless there's a coming in, just to be with him, just to be with him. We come in for fellowship, and then out for service. We come in for worship, and then out for witness. We come in for communion with him and then out for communication with the world. But our service, our witness, our communication with the world will be weak unless we've come in to be with him. This is the commission for those twelve, to be with me and then to go out. And when we come in prayer, we're coming to be with him. We're equipping ourselves then to go out. And you know, when we spend time with God in prayer, he speaks. You see, prayer is not one-sided. In the book of Acts, let me just show you a few verses there. In the book of Acts, 
You find again and again when people and when groups of people are spending time in prayer, God speaks to them. Let me show in Acts chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. And this is when Saul of Tarsus was converted and God speaks to a man called Ananias and told him to go and visit Saul of Tarsus in Damascus. And in Acts 9 verse 11, the Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. He's praying and God has spoken to him. That's Acts 9, 11 and 12. Acts chapter 10 and verse 9. Let me read you this event. Acts chapter 10 and verse 9. Peter is in Joppa. About noon the following day as they were on their journey and approached the city, Peter went up onto the roof to pray. Now read the rest of that story. While he was praying, it says he went into a trance and there was a vision of a net being lowered down from heaven with unclean animals and the instruction, get up and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord. Now that's a contradiction in terms to start with. No, Lord. But Peter said it twice in the Bible. If he's Lord, don't say no. If you say no, he's not Lord. But Peter said, no, Lord, because I've instructed in the rules of Judaism and it is against the law to eat these animals. They're, they're unclean. And the second time, the same event, the third time, Peter thought there must be something going on here. God is speaking to me. God is showing me something. What is it? And there was a knock on the door. And up in Caesarea was a man called Cornelius who had also been praying. And as he prayed, God spoke to him and said, send for Peter from Joppa. Cornelius, you see, was a good man, but he was not a Christian. His prayers, his good works had come up, said God is a sweet-smelling savior. God loved his good works, but they didn't save him. And they said to Peter, would you come and speak to Cornelius, the centurion? And Peter thought, he's a Gentile. Gentiles are dirty. Oh, I just got the message. That's what the dream was about. God told me what previously we regard as dirty, God now shows us to be clean. And he went to Cornelius' house and Cornelius was converted. And when Cornelius gave his testimony in chapter 10 and verse 30, in chapter 10 and verse 30, it says there, Cornelius answered four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer. While I was praying, God spoke to me. Like in chapter 13 and verse 2, you've got the church in Antioch. Now the whole leadership of the church in Antioch. It says, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, it doesn't mention prayer, but if they're worshipping and fasting, you can be absolutely sure prayer was part of it. While they're worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. While they're worshipping, fasting, while they're in communion with God, God spoke to them. Chapter 22 of Acts and verse 17, Paul tells of an event that took place earlier in his life. He says, I returned to Jerusalem. I was praying at the temple. I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking quick. He said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because I'll not accept your testimony about me. But the point is this, I was praying in the temple when God spoke to me and said, leave Jerusalem. Now I'm just quoting these verses to show you that it's while people were praying that God spoke. And let me say this, if you complain that God never speaks to me, in all probability, you rarely pray. You see, prayer brings you in touch with God where God can speak to you as well as you speaking to Him. Now, how God speaks to you is something you learn to recognize. There's no standard answer to that question. Driving down here tonight with uh, two of my children, I said to them, how do you expect God to speak to you? And they gave me some interesting answers. Matthew, who's 11, said, I would eat some alphabet soup and hope the letters came out the right way. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting way to discern the will of God. <laughs> Don't all buy alphabet soup next week and see if it works. <laughs> but God will speak. How God speaks is his business. 
People ask me, like, how does God speak to you? Well, there's some standard, of course, things by which God speaks. He speaks through his word. But there are all kinds of ways he speaks in the heart. And you've learned to discern how God speaks to you in your experience of him. But speak to you, he will. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Letters to Malcolm. That was a fictitious name. Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. And in that book, he talks about the skeptics who mock the idea of prayer. And he says in this book, he's speaking to God in this book, and this is what Lewis writes. He says, they tell me, Lord, that when I pray, only one voice is heard, that I am dreaming, and you're not there, and this whole thing is absurd. There's no one there but me. Maybe they are right, Lord, says Lewis. Maybe they're right that when I pray, only one voice is heard. But that is not my voice. It is yours. I am not dreaming. You are the dreamer and I am the dream, says Lewis. Beautiful picture. Prayer brings us into relationship. That's the first thing. And the others will be shorter. The second thing is prayer brings us into responsibility. You see, prayer in the first instance is about God working in us. If prayer is talking and listening to God, then God will have some important things to say to us, sometimes some penetrating things to say to us. In the Old Testament, there are many stories of people dealing with God, talking with God. And God sometimes speaking very penetratingly to them and bringing them into new responsibility. Remember in Genesis 32, the story of Jacob when he wrestled with God in a place called Peniel. Jacob, as you know, was a bit of a, a rogue, to say the least. And he met with God and he wrestled with God and eventually he cried out to God, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. Now that was something new for Jacob because Jacob had been a, a cheat and a twister and a, got his own way in life. I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And so the wrestling match stopped and God said to him, what is your name? Now a very interesting thing for God to have said to Jacob. Because God knew exactly what his name was. What is your name? And he answered, Jacob. Now the name Jacob means twister. Literally, Jacob means to grasp the heel because Jacob was a twin, the second of the twins. Esau was his older brother by just a few minutes because he came out grasping his heel. And this idea of grasping his heel was sort of gr an idea of grabbing and grasping and cheating and pushing his own way through life. And that's how Jacob had been. He cheated his brother, you remember the story, many of you, out of his birthright in exchange for some stew. Now Esau was foolish, I know, but it, Jacob set up the plot and cheated it and tried to get his brother's birthright. And then he had to get the blessing from their father to go with the birthright. And he deceived his father and cheated his father who'd lost his eyesight. And he brought a meal for his father and his father said, you sound like Jacob. No, no, I'm Esau. And he disguised himself like Esau. Esau was a hairy man, it tells us. And he was so hairy that what Jacob had done to disguise himself was to kill a goat and wrap the goat skin around his arm, around his neck. He came to his father and said, I may sound like Jacob because I've got a bit of a cold, but feel me and see, I am Esau. And his father felt him and said, well, it has the voice of Jacob, but it feels like Esau. Esau was pretty hairy, you can be sure of that, because a goat skin wrapped around Jacob's arm felt like Esau. And he said, has the smell of Esau. So Esau smelt like a goat. <laughs> I mean, these two twins were anything but identical. Esau was the hairy man. He didn't dress, didn't wash himself in the morning, just combed himself all over. Whereas Jacob was pink. <laughs> 
He stayed at home with mummy, helped her with the cooking, while Esau was the outdoor man who went out hunting. Totally contrasting brothers. And Jacob was the cheat. And he got the blessing from his father, went for the birthright. And then he cheated his father-in-law. Or rather, he'd been cheated first by his father-in-law. His father-in-law called Laban latched onto the kind of man this was. He said, I want to marry your second daughter. Her name's Rachel. She's beautiful. Okay, said Laban, work seven years for me, and then we'll have a wedding. And on seven years, they had the wedding. And they brought the bride in, of course, covered with her, her, her veil. And it was only that night when he took the veil off, he realized this is not the girl I wanted to marry. This is his older girl, Leah. Older sister, Leah. And he went back to his father-in-law. You've cheated me out of my... Wife, he said, okay, you can have her too, but work another seven years for this one. And so Jacob had been cheated by his father-in-law. Began his own back, he cheated his father-in-law then by getting the sheep to breed in such a way. All the weak sheep belonged to Laban. All the strong sheep belonged to Jacob. And then he cheated his father-in-law again by taking his wives and children off by night and getting his wife to steal some things from her father's tent before they left. I mean, he's a sneaky man. Interestingly, 25% of the book of Genesis is actually the biography of Jacob. And God says, what is your name? With a name like that, and a history like that, and the name Jacob, meaning the one who grasps the heel, the cheater, the sneak. What's your name? Jacob, the sneak, the cheater. The manipulator, the liar. And God said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Do you know what Israel means? Prince with God. Because now you've dealt with me, Jacob. You've wrestled with me, Jacob. People have seen that as being a, a type of prayer, because sometimes there is a wrestling with God. And I know, Jacob, you're the cheat, the twister. Your name is Jacob. That's who you are. I know, but I'm going to give you a new name and a new identity and a new character. Israel. And you know, remarkably, he's one of the leading characters of Scripture. God introduced himself. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Just remind yourself of the mess he was. I'm the God of Jacob. He didn't say the God of Israel when he introduced himself that way. Because I take ordinary people. But you see, it's in communion with God. That's why I say prayer brings responsibility. You deal business with God, he may start changing your name. Which means changing your character. Which means changing your behavior. Which means changing your whole life. And if we're going to be people of prayer, we're going to bring ourselves into that place before God when he can take us and change us and give responsibility. Jacob became the father as Israel of the nation. His 12 sons became the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's most likely tonight, if you watch the news, you'll see his name in the news tonight. Israel. You see, God asks questions when we start dealing with him. Adam, you see, knew communion with God in the Garden of Eden. It says, in a very picturesque way, God would walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And one day they sinned. And when God came to the Garden, Adam had hidden himself. And God asked the question, where are you? Not because he didn't know. Not because this was a game of hide and seek and God was giving up. He knew exactly where Adam was, but he needed Adam to tell him where he was. As he needed, ja as he needed Jacob to tell him who he was. And when you begin to commune with God, the day may come when you hear the voice saying, where are you? Because you stepped out of the will of God. But he'll call you back. He made clothes of skin for Adam. You ever notice the significance of that? Adam had made clothes of fig leaves. He was embarrassed now about his nakedness. But God made clothes of skin. That's the first time any animal died in the whole of history. When God made clothes of skin, 
blood was shed that Adam might be covered with the skin of the animal whose life was given. A foreshadowing, of course, the day would come when somebody's life will be given and you will be covered with his righteousness. I'm not saying that was true for Adam. I don't know the eternal state of Adam. There's nothing to indicate Adam ever got right, but this was symbolic of it. But the point I'm making is this, that when we begin to speak with God, it not only brings us into relationship with him, it brings us into responsibility. He'll say, what is your name? Embarrassing question sometimes, but I'm going to change it. Where are you? I want you to identify where you are, because when you name it, then he can do something. But the third thing I want to tell you is that prayer brings us into results as well. Brings into relationship, brings into responsibility. You see, things happen when we pray. There's another Old Testament picture of prayer. It is often seen as this in Exodus chapter 17. You may be familiar with the story. The Israelites had left Egypt where they'd been enslaved for many years. And they meet their first enemy who's out to destroy them. It's a group called the Amalekites. And God told Moses to get Joshua, who was then a young man, the first time Joshua appears and is named in Scripture, get Joshua to organize an army to go and fight against the Amalekites. But don't put your dependency in the army. Go up on the hillside with the staff of God in your hand and hold it in the air. And as you hold it in the air, I'll give victory to Joshua down in the valley as you are on the mountainside. And Moses went up, held the staff in the air, and uh, remarkably the Israelites began to overcome the Amalekites. And when Moses got tired and maybe the, 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 the staff would droop, the, Is the Amalekites would begin to prevail against the Israelites. And Moses would raise the staff again and they begin to overwhelm the Amalekites. He'd maybe stop for a scratch or something and here's the Amalekite coming. Oh, got him. As he raised his hand, there was power in the valley in the battle. And he got tired, and Aaron and Hur sat him on a stone and propped him up. And it says at the end, God said, I want you to build an altar and call it, The Lord is my banner. In fact, he said, You make sure Joshua hears about this. In case Joshua thinks it's being a good soldier that wins battles. You make sure Joshua hears about this. He built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of God. And whatever else that may indicate, doesn't talk about prayer, doesn't use that word prayer, but the image and the picture of prayer is that His hands were lifted up to the throne of God as Joshua, uh, sorry, as Moses on the mountain has his focus on God, not on the problem. They discovered victory in the valley. You see, prayer brings us into results. It brings us into the victory of God. You see, when our focus is on the eternal, the temporal falls into place. When our focus is on heaven, the events of earth fall into the right perspective. When our focus is on the victor, we begin to experience the victory. And that's why one aspect of prayer is as we intercede with God, He brings us into results. Things begin to happen in our lives. Things begin to happen in our circumstances. And they're inexplicable other than the fact God is doing something. And Moses with his sights on God, his hands reached up to heaven. The events of earth ceased to frighten him. And he trusts. There's an old chorus we used to sing. I remember we still sing it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Do you know this one? Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you're frightened by things of earth, and of course we all are, we're under pressure from all kinds of sources. Many of you here tonight are facing issues that you really don't know how to cope with them. But when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, the things of earth grow strangely dim. They're not unimportant. 
But in the light of his glory and his grace, they get their right perspective. Do you want to know God better? That's really what praying is about. We don't isolate prayer from anything else, of course. We need to read the Word of God. We need to allow the Spirit of God to be showing us things in all kinds of ways. But as we get to spend time with God, as we get to know God, as we talk with God, we will deepen our relationship. We will broaden our responsibility as with Jacob. And we'll heighten the results as with Moses. That's why that little ditty is probably true. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Because the weakest saint in touch with God has all the resources of heaven. To work in him, in her, through her, through him. And so Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray, not if you're in a fix and you decide it's, I ought to pray about this, but when you pray as one of the most important things in your Christian life, you'll discover the Christian life is a relationship which deepens and grows. And the greatest benefit of prayer is you know God better and more deeply. Well, let's pray together and let's thank God for the privilege of knowing him like this. Father, we're grateful to you tonight that you're a living God. We're not in love with the memory of somebody who once lived, but we're in love with someone who lives and in whom we find ourselves to be complete. Because it's in our relationship with you that we find the deepest needs of our hearts being fulfilled. Thank you for the glorious privilege of prayer, of being able to talk to you, of being able to hear you as you speak to us in whatever way you wish to speak to us. But you do speak, you do direct us, you do whisper into our hearts, and we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that out of sheer love for you, out of a sheer desire to know you better, we'll be people who pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory.